Welcome to the Sports Pro Podcast. Hi everyone and welcome once again to the Sports Pro Podcast. My name is Owen Connolly. I'm the editor at large at Sports Pro. Hope you're well. Sustainability is top, middle and bottom of the agenda today, looking at how the sports business can start thinking more efficiently, more responsibly uh, about its impact on the environment and its impact in a range of other areas. Uh, We have two experts to guide us through this over the next half an hour or so. Uh, Matthew Campelli is the Director of Sustainability at Touchline and also the founder and editor of the Sustainability Report. Hello, Matt. Hey, Owen. Uh, Good to be here. Thanks for having me. Great to have you with us. Hattie Park is the Sustainability Manager at the All England Lawn Tennis Club, uh, the host, of course, of the Wimbledon Championships. Hello, Hattie. Hi there. Um, Guys, we're going to be getting some thoughts from you about this topic in the sports industry. We're looking in particular at the triple bottom line and how uh, business and sustainability objectives can be aligned uh, in throughout an organization's operations. Um, we're also going to be hearing a bit later on about the inaugural Sports Pro Sustainability Hackathon, uh, where we had students from all, all of whom trying to break into the industry, uh, presenting solutions for sport in the years ahead. Uh, we'll be getting the winning pitch from the students of Sheffield Hallam University in a session that took place at Sports Pro Live last week. But guys, just to just to start us off, I mean, Matt, not to tell on myself or anything, but we were initially meant to be doing this podcast a couple of weeks ago. We had a date in the diary. Uh, I think we probably had a diary block on Outlook and all the rest of it. And uh, we then postponed because there was a very big and very noisy story from the world of football um, and the Super League that was going to change everything and didn't, didn't happen at all. Um, but I was thinking about that coming into today's recording and you know it feels kind of the classic metaphor for how sustainability often gets treated as a priority in in sport and in lots of other industries where yes it's a medium term idea that lots of people carry in their heads and and are very kind of well-meaning about but once there's a short-term priority it can uh it can overtake it absolutely and i think I like the fact that you brought up the European Super League because if you talk about an idea that didn't think about sustainability in a short, medium, or even long term, the European Super League uh, is probably that idea, really. I mean, if it did actually happen, uh, and luckily it looks like it's been kicked into the long grass for at least a, the short to medium term. I mean, one of the things we need to look at is, is that the environmental impact of that, of that European Super League, if it, if it did go ahead. Um, you know, fans flying around Europe for, for, for group games, I think there was a study that I saw that came out shortly afterwards that said that hosting the European Super League is the equivalent of adding 100,000 cars to a road annually, you know, in terms of carbon impact as well. So, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because um, when we think about the, the, the kind of thinking of sport, we talk, we talk about this kind of short-term thinking about, about revenue, which has always, always been the case, really, these kind of very short cycles. Uh, and that was typical, a typical example of, of, a, of an idea or a thought that didn't really factor in the whole kind of sustainability, sustainability idea. Um, but more broadly speaking, I think we're looking at a sports industry that now is, I don't want to say on the kind of cusp, but, you know, very, very slowly moving towards this idea of thinking about sustainability more holistically now and thinking about it more in the round rather than it being ad hoc or just something that's a bit siloed. Uh, and hopefully, you know, our conversation will reflect a little bit more on that today and be interested to hear what Hattie says around Wimbledon and what she's doing as well. Now, Hattie, as, a, as I said at the top there, we're trying to look at this from the perspective of of the triple bottom line um which you will be familiar with as a concept matt will be familiar with as a concept it might be new to to some of the people listening what what do we mean by that well for me very simply triple bottom line is is about not being purely profit focused which i suppose matt was sort of reflecting on earlier so thinking about the the triple impacts and potentially benefits you have in terms of people, planet and profit um, and looking to ideally have a positive impact on all those three areas. So it's, you know, don't just focus on profit. So think about your impact in the community, your how you look after your staff, how uh, the, the, the sort of 
um, that the wider reach that you have as a sport or an organisation. Um, particularly, you know, my personal interest at the All England Club is around environmental sustainability. Um, but at Wimbledon, there's also a lot that we do in terms of thinking about community impact and working with, with within our local community as well. And where does that thinking start? We'll, let's, we'll spend a bit of time kind of looking at the theory and some best practice. But at the AELTC um, specifically, where does sustainability plug in? You know, how it, it feels like one of those things where I think I, I remember in another context, someone saying it was like trying to get a stone out of your shoe while you're running. Sometimes when you try and introduce concepts like this into uh, into operations and management. But, you know, how have you worked to implement that? I mean, I think it is something as an organisation, you know, we are we want to promote the sport of tennis. You know, we, we are about tennis and we want to retain Wimbledon and the championships at the pinnacle of our sport. But we also want to be a force for good. And there are definitely two parallel but sort of integrated streams that guide how we act as an organisation. So actually, you know, thinking about that triple bottom line is it's kind of how we think as an organization that aligns with our values as well we I suppose from sort of to give you a personal perspective on introducing an environmental sustainability strategy at the club it starts with there was already uh, and we launched our environment positive strategy at the beginning of 2020 but there was already a lot of work in place and it was perhaps more of a sort of bottom-up approach but you then you know we then get the the executive team and the board very much involved and supporting from the top down so you kind of I suppose meet meet in the middle but working out what your impacts are and what you can do about them Uh, day to day you know we part of it is about the long term but then there's also each year what incremental improvements we can make for the championships so that the experience of people coming to the championships or players competing is a little bit more sustainable each year. But then within the framework of a long term goal. So we have a 2030 environment positive goal. And so lots of our we have this incredible opportunity with this site wide regeneration of our estate that can put in place things that will really reduce our impact over the long term. And then each year in the championship, there'll be hopefully something else that's that's new um, and and different. So you, so it's bits. It's short term, long term, and then positive impact at the end of it. Matt, where where is this concept come from? What's the what's the background to it? Because obviously, everybody is aware that there's been discussions about environmental responsibility, community responsibility in sport um for for quite some time but where what's the evolution of the idea that you can combine it with uh with with more kind of straightforward operational objectives and and basically make it pay off to think a little bit more sustainably well that that, that's the that's the key thing uh that sport needs to look at owen is looking at sustainability as a kind of business imperative and objective and i know you know the sport for good movement has been happening for a long time now um but a lot of that stuff was kind of ad hoc, was in within foundation stuff that wasn't typically intrinsic to the organisation. What we're looking at now is sustainability being a huge business objective because we're seeing sustainability. We're seeing evidence now emerge, and it's only emerging evidence currently, but evidence emerging that sustainability and a focus on sustainability is helping sport achieve some of its, some of its other core objectives. So, for example, engaging partners, for example, engaging more fans or engaging a different subset of fans who wouldn't particularly be traditionally uh, interested in sport. So I think what we're seeing now is it becoming more of a business case. We're seeing more people in sport focus on sustainability, whether they're people who work in, in roles like marketing or communications, sustainability is becoming part of their part of their uh, their workflow. Or in some very rare instances, sustainability professionals like Hattie uh, are being hired specifically to look at sustainability. And I think sport is, is actually seeing it as, or starting to see it, as a key business objective. Now, we're still at very early stages. I think there are very few sports organizations who are looking at it in a very holistic way. But I think it's growing. I think it's growing, particularly because sport, I think, as an industry knows that without a solid, healthy environment, that sport as as an industry, you know, limits its 
potential because you know if you can't play matches in, in certain parts of the in certain parts of the year or in certain countries, then you limit sports um, kind of uh, financial in, uh, um, uh, potential as well. So they're seeing it's very much hopefully as, as more of a business imperative now. Can I just, I mean, I think the climate impacts are really starting to hit sport now. And so sport is waking up to the fact that, you know, climate change is something that is happening and affecting it. And not only are we contributing to this, but we can also, in a in a positive way, be part of the solution. So it, it it's happening. And there is, I feel that there's a real sort of groundswell of, of growing awareness and people wanting to take action. And what's you know what what stages Matt are, are we seeing organisations get to in their thinking on this? Well, obviously it's not going to be uniform, but but where where are we seeing progress and where are we seeing a need for greater understanding or, or greater engagement with it? Yeah, I think like you say, it varies depending on organisation. But I think we're at the stage, and Hattie kind of alluded to this just a second ago. I think we're at the stage where that that, that broad awareness is there. So, for example. We've got this UNFCCC Sports for Climate Action Framework, which happy to explain to, to your listeners if they're not aware of it or, or familiar with it. But we're getting lots of organisations sign up to this framework because they know they have to do something about climate change. I think where we're really at now is they know they have to do something. Many have made a commitment. Now it's just taking that step to actually taking some real concrete action towards it. And that's why I think there may be a, a barrier for some organisations doing that, doing that actual technical work moving from commitment to actually doing it but i think i think that's where we're on the cusp of now commitment's been made by most now it's time to get into actually doing the work and and actually reducing those environmental impacts hattie just to give us a bit more grounding in this conversation as well what what's your background before you joined the aeltc where where had you been uh where had you been working i was working at the bbc for about eight or nine years as sustainability manager there so I started my earlier career, I worked in um, an investment bank and um, was kind of go, going through the motions, I suppose, but wanted to do something that I personally cared about. And I left there in 2004. I, I did a, um, a master's course at Imperial College in 2006 and then to sort of transition, learn the language of how to talk about sustainability in, in corporate speak, I suppose, um, and then went back to the investment bank, which happened to be Lehman Brothers, so didn't stay there very long because it it went bust, uh, and then joined the BBC and was at the BBC for nine years, and then um, came into Wimbledon in February yeah. 2019. Just on a practical level, what have your experiences in sport been like, and, and how did they reflect... Or, or how did they follow up on, on what you went through with the BBC, which is a, a very big, broad organisation. Obviously, when you talk about environmental and, and community impacts, it has them in all kinds of different directions, even though it is ostensibly a media company. Um, you know, How did that affect your thinking and, and how does that experience compare to what, what you've seen so far in sport? Well, I mean, I think what you need to do is think about your own impact as an organization but more importantly think about the sort of bigger picture the bigger influence that you can have and so at the BBC for example that they they have quite an environmental footprint but the bigger footprint that they have is is in a way through the programming and so over the course of the sort of eight to nine years that I was there there was a gradual shift to really recognizing that the program has has the biggest impact and so you had things like blue planet where there was just this wake up moment on plastic um arriving at at wimbledon i think in a way that that sort of mental transition had already been made and the we're a signatory to the un sport for climate action framework as well and and it, i really like that as a framework because it is about there are two sides to it there's the take action and mitigate and reduce your own impacts but also use your platform to to you know get across to you know raise awareness and educate and the so the signatories which are across the board in sport they they're kind of aware of that 
Um, and exactly as Matt said, initially it was sign up and now it's really sort of buttoning down what does being a signatory actually mean and you know what sort of reporting is going to be required and what sort of steps are going to be required to make sure that you reduce your impact. And there it's been really a, a nice thing to be part of because you you ha- there are working groups with different sports. And I suppose within tennis as well, sharing with the other Grand Slam championships, you know, working with people who, talking to people who do a similar job to me there, finding out what they're doing um, is really, you know, while sport is maybe a little bit competitive, there's something quite nice that we can share uh, what we're doing with regards to having a positive impact um, because the, the more we, we know, we either all win or we all lose, right? So we might as well share and, um, you know, make bigger progress together. Yeah. Um, I mean, you, you made a really interesting point there about the influence of programming at, at the BBC. And I, I kind of want to come back to that in a, in a sports context and the kind of uh, campaigning versus action part of things. But just before we go any further with this, Matt, I do think you did offer that we should hear a bit more about what the... Uh, what the UN Charter is on this, and and uh, and and what its kind of what its substance is. Okay, so the, the UN Charter was uh, established about two and a half years ago, I think, COP twenty four, twenty four in Poland in twenty eighteen, um, and it was put together by the UN, and I think the IOC were big uh, big stakeholders in putting it together. And basically, it's um, it set out to be the, the Paris Climate Agreement for Sport. So people who sign up to the framework have to commit to measuring, producing, or offsetting their carbon emissions and doing a number of other things around it. So as well as doing the operational stuff like reducing carbon emissions, they also have to do a fair amount around advocacy as well and engaging you know, their, their stakeholders in sport. And I think arguably that's where sport has, and you alluded to this a minute ago, where sport has potentially its biggest impact. Uh, so yeah, a lot around operational stuff, but also around engagement as well. So how to just... Coming back to that point again, um, when you're thinking about what the sustainability strategy is at Wimbledon, now it's a big event. It's a it's an event where there's a lot of you know nature plays a part in it, and the 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 grounds and all the the kind of presentation and everything. You have to think about resources. You have to think about what kind of um, from uh, an, an ecosystem perspective, you've got to think about what uh, habitat you you want in in, in the, on the grounds. Um, all these kind of things and then that's before you get to the actual running of, of the tennis tournament itself and um, and the impact that that can have but given the scale of the audience are you thinking in some terms in a similar way to how you you were thinking at the BBC where it's a case of well we can do our bit but it's a you know we're, it's a two-week tennis tournament and then it's a private tennis club there is a scale of influence we can have outside of this that that's more important there's there's definitely a scale of influence we can have year round through our relationships with our commercial partners through the sort of term, terms of business that we put in place to work with with other people but during the championships at that the opportunity is much greater um we have half a million guests coming into the grounds to enjoy the tennis. And of course, the number one priority is they have an amazing day out watching the tennis. Um, But there is an opportunity to kind of talk to them about other things that matter to us. And we, so, so there are various sort of touch points where people can hopefully experience a more, a, a sort of environment, environmentally friendly day and in you you know you talked about the the biodiversity you know we have a living surface that we play on but the club itself you know that the front of center court is alive essentially with you know with the the vine up it um it's not a vine I've said the wrong thing I think but the the living wall on number one court (laughs) using planting to kind of guide people around the grounds rather than rather than walls so people hopefully that there's a the orchard at the top the hill you know we we present tennis in an english garden and so people do hopefully get a sense of that um and then there's the kind of well what what are we what are we selling people you know can you get vegetarian or vegan food and and you can at all of the 
the food out that's you know you can get vegan cream with your Wimbledon strawberry um, really eliminating the plastic so no plastic bags in the shops um, you know introducing a reusable cup for drinks that lots of sports organizations have done hopefully you know involving the players a little bit that's can be a bit more of a challenge because when the players are coming they are coming to compete you know that is their that's their focus for that period that they're there but just a small example in the 2019 championships the racket stringers took away the plastic bags that they they used to restring the racket and it went in a plastic bag they took away those plastic bags and well in the big scheme of things that's a a, a small environmental impact it was quite symbolic and Kevin Anderson who's one of the top men's players did a film with the with the racket stringers and and you know hopefully perhaps sadly not this year because of all the different protocols around covid but hopefully you know in time we can do a bit more of that because there is this time during during yeah. ju- end of june beginning of july where we do have a platform you're listening to the sports pro podcast this year is it is quite difficult to to talk about a, a typical tournament because we're not going to have a typical tournament this year it will be a different scale and, and and a different experience for the people who do attend but i guess when you're looking at a, a, a tournament in isolation there's two things you've got to think about how do we get wimbledon ready how do we get the all england club ready to stage it and then what is the day of uh a, of a guest going to be like and how do we weave sustainability into, into both of those things well, we had in again going back to 2019, we had an, an area, a space in the grounds that was sustainability at Wimbledon, and it was in the a really nice space in the southern part of the grounds that was um, a, a kind of done together with our commercial partners to talk about try and show a more a positive view of a sustainable future, and it was themed with four different themes. So there was a, an area, a, one corner about low carbon travel so um, there was an electric car in there there was another area about the, explaining the circular economy so um, recycled plastic bottles being made into bottles again talked about planet friendly food and drink so you know there, there's there's an opportunity to communicate to people when they come in and then you think about how you know 80 percent of people arrive on public transport that's great you know encouraging what sort of information are we giving to people? How are they receiving that information? Um, The ballot, the the famous Wimbledon ballot has now gone online. Um, That's reducing a whole load of paper, mailings. You know, that's another sort of way that we're subtly addressing our impact, but not necessarily really sort of forcing that message. In the last couple of weeks, we've um, seen details of the latest phase of the Wimbledon Master Plan, which is kind of it's an always evolving thing. There's always another big project on the horizon and th- th- there's always development going on of one kind or another or changes going on of one kind or another to think about what is Wimbledon going to be like 10 years from now, 15 years from now. And, you know, we've, we've seen a few things emerge for 2030. How, how have you programmed sustainable objectives into, into that project? Well, I mean, the... The, the sort of site-wide regeneration, sustainability is very much at the heart of that. I mean, you know, tennis is the is the number one goal, but it's also to um, enhance the community and, and the environment as well. And so we've always talked about bringing the qualifying tournament onto that site. But thinking about the plans, we are from my point of view, proposing a kind of environment positive goal for the organisation was made a whole lot easier knowing that we had this opportunity. And so we're looking at how we can build in uh, ways that we can decarbonise heat. So, you know, what technologies can we use by having that opportunity of of a redevelopment on that site to get us off gas more broadly across the whole site, the enhancements to the biodiversity that we can deliver um, you know, introducing new habitats, um, protecting all of the, the veteran trees, strengthening the woodland. It gives us an incredible opportunity. And, and I mean, all I can say is it's very much part of our thinking. Um, it's, it's kind of integrated across the work streams. Um, and, the, you know, it's t- 
talked about every day in terms of how that site is going to work. I mean, you know, we're, we're going to put tennis courts there, but and we're going to do it, look at how we can harvest water um, and, and reuse as much as we can, you know, increasingly precious resource. And then, you know, improving the sort of entry and exit points to make it even more appealing to arrive on public transport, reducing the amount of car parking that would be there. So the whole thing, while it will hopefully maintain Wimbledon as the kind of pinnacle of of tennis grand slams, will also enhance the sort of community and environmental experience and enable us to sort of try new things, you know, showcase best practice in, in construction, getting a bit carried away now but it's it's a fantastic opportunity and and one that's definitely been really sort of gripped by the organization and obviously in a a project of that scale and and something that um is going to continue over a period of several years there'll be lots of voices involved there'll be lots of competing priorities uh involved from time to time as as kind of harmonious as everything can start out you know everybody has their own uh, their own things that they want to accomplish What's the challenge for you over the next few years in ensuring that there's that focus on the triple bottom line throughout the throughout the, the progress of that? Well, I, I suppose it's just making sure we hold the focus. I mean, the I don't think it's so much of a, a challenge because it it is baked into what we want to do. But for me, the thing is how long everything will take, and understanding now as we've started, you know, and experts on the team. This, programming in what needs to happen and when um, there are only certain times of the year when you can um, do, do the sort of planting you know you, you have to do certain things at certain times of the year and therefore it's all going to take quite a long time um, and when you say competing interests you know we we're um, consulting with local community groups with the local the local authorities and fingers crossed, we get the go ahead to do it. Um, it, it we, we're not even at that stage yet, but we're presenting our plans and doing all of the consultations. And so far it's going well. Um, but as you say, things may change. We just got to hope that people can see the kind of the, the positive intention behind it all and, and the lot of work that has gone in um, behind the scenes to get us to the point where we totally understand the landscape and have come up with this kind of tennis in an English landscape concept um matt before we pass on to the the gang from sheffield hallam and um and their project uh, in the hackathon i just wanted to broaden the conversation out again and and look at uh look at some best practice across the industry and, and some of the challenges that that the industry faces in incorporating this kind of thinking where are we seeing this triple bottom line approach applied well at the moment are there any examples or any kind of broad trends where you're you're quite impressed yeah i mean you're at certain types of organization uh and different kinds of uh and they'll be doing it in a slightly different way so for example you'll have uh football clubs like vfl Wolfsburg in the german bundesliga obviously owned by an automotive company in vw which was Quite honestly, hit really badly a couple of years ago with the emission scandal, which need, needs to keep its house in order and needs to have a, a what we call a license to operate, basically. You know, reporting your emissions, being really strong with your sustainability strategy and reporting. And that has kind of filtered down to the football clubs. So you've got those organizations that are, I suppose are few and far between are owned by a, a wider company that does sustainability best practice and that filters down to the sports team, like, like in Wolfsburg, for example. Then we'll have organizations that will have someone who's working in a kind of semi-senior capacity who will be a real kind of force of nature, who will try and pick things up and really drag an organization along and and put sustainability sustainability at the heart of what they're doing, really try to engage leadership on that. So that'll be, I suppose, a more kind of individual perspective, you know, a really strong person who's really moving sustainability forward at a number of sports clubs. And I think that's probably the most likely um, type of you know kind of setup we have in sport at the moment, having some you know a really really passionate person within an organisation trying to move things forward, and then we'll have sports that have just been created with sustainability as a core kind of concept. Formula E, Extreme E, E One, for example, uh, Air Speeder to some extent as well, and those kind of sports I think will kind of increase going forward when they see there's an opportunity to engage not just traditional sports fans, but non-traditional sports fans. 
Uh, and then the final area, one of the best areas of best practice I've seen is when sports organizations, they see something sustainability-wise that's really intrinsic to their organization and they jump on it and they do something about it. So the best example I can give currently is World Athletics. They've seen that air quality is a big issue for recreational uh, elite runners as well. Um, and they've made air quality a key part of their strategy because they know, right, our key demographic, our key, key stakeholders are being impacted by this really massive sustainability issue. Can we do something about this? So those are kind of the four areas. Now, in terms of where I can see kind of um, improvement, I mean, sport has got so much potential, not just in terms of, you know, engaging people, but just operationally as well. I mean, a really interesting study came out last week in Australia looking at how um, stadiums, if they utilize their roofs for solar energy, you know, what kind of impact that would have on the kind of on the grid and on carbon emissions. And stadiums being the hub of sustainable development, you know, you know trying to um, test and pilot and try sustainable um, innovation, I think it's probably the kind of next frontier for sport actually really pushing on and really doing something within this area of sustainable development. You know, stadiums like the Johan Cruyff Arena in Amsterdam are probably the best example of this. But that's where, apart from its kind of cultural significance, that's probably a sport can have a really, really big impact in moving, moving the needle, I think. And Hattie, just to, to finish us off on this part of the conversation, what would be some of your top tips for people who are trying to integrate sustainable thinking into their organisation in sport? I would think find ways to make it relevant to your business. And the little things matter as well. If you've got a team there, get people involved on a day-to-day basis. You def- You need the support from the top, but and and they can kind of give you the confidence to go and be ambitious but you also need to involve um the you know both both top down and and bottom up and i think encouraging learning get informed get your top down support and then you know introduce little things that involve everybody and and just you know we gave everybody a reusable drinks cup you know it was a small thing but it was a kind of it was it was showing that as a, as an organisation we're committed to making this work for you as well as putting in place zero carbon construction principles which don't necessarily touch the in everyone on a day to day basis so it's kind of quite tricky because you need to do everything you got to do the big things buy renewable electricity get on a renewable um, energy contract make sure you um, have segregate your waste um, those are much more easy to do. Um, than people might think. Well, we're going to hear about um, another solution for uses of space, uses of resources, and uh, at the same time, uh, a way of, of getting people active. It's a, it's a, it's the winning pitch in the inaugural Sports Pro Sustainability Hackathon, which took place from the 9th to the 11th of April. Uh, there was a focus on the triple bottom line. We had over 90 students from some of the top sports business universities around the world competing for the chance to present at Sports Pro Live. The winners were from Sheffield Hallam University um, and they put together a very composed presentation last week um, for Adam Leventhal and Paul Guest who will be uh, leading you through the session just after the break. Matt, I believe you had some involvement in, uh, in this project as well. What kind of thinking are we seeing more widely um, from the next generation of uh, of, of business leaders and, and sports leaders? Firstly, one of the most encouraging things is that young sports uh, sports management students are thinking about sustainability as, as part of the, the wider piece of sports business now. And we're seeing more courses incorporate sustainability modules within their, uh, within their, uh, their courses, which is great. Um, and I think just the, the kind of overall look, I mean, I, I think that I, mean, I, I certainly hope that the future sports leaders um, will not look at sustainability as a kind of, as a separate thing is when they look at you know the, the sports business as a whole and where they need to improve and where they need to create a strong business they really see sustainability as as a, as a core function of business and that we won't have be having you know conversations around sustainability which makes it feel like a an ad hoc uh, ad hoc part of the sports business just something that is just there needs to be done needs to be done well and it's part of a key key performance metric when you're uh, when you're leading an organization okay well we'll be hearing some of those ideas from the team at Sheffield Hallam just after this. Hello, I'm Matt Rogan. I've spent my career creating and scaling businesses in sports and entertainment. And now 
I'm talking to smart leaders inside and outside sport to get their ideas on managing change and building towards a better future. You can listen in on the Playbook podcast, a collection of candid, agenda-free conversations full of practical advice your company can work with. Get your new episodes right here on the Sports Pro feed and check out the rest of the series wherever you get your podcasts. Ladies and gentlemen, a very, very warm welcome to the Transformation Arena. It is Adam Leventhal here with you once again. A very good morning, a good afternoon, a good evening to wherever you are in the world. Um, we have a lot to look forward to today on this Transformation Arena, the Transformation Stage, let's call it for a moment. And backstage at Sports Pro Live 2021, I have seen some very cool, calm, considered people ready for their big opportunity here at Sports Pro Live 2021. Um, Sports Pro's first ever sustainability hackathon took place between the 9th and the 11th of April, and it focused on the triple bottom line. And over 90 students from some of the top sports business universities from around the world, from Sheffield to Syracuse to Columbia to Coventry, were all competing for the top prize. And that was, which we will soon see, see very, very soon indeed, and that is presenting at Sports Pro Live 2021. As you saw, the winners were Sheffield Hallam University, and it is uh, immense congratulations to the team at Sheffield Hallam University. We're going to be seeing their pitch very, very shortly indeed. And um, we're going to be hearing from the judges, the students, uh, the lecturers, the whole lot within this initial session here on the Transformation Arena. And we'll also be analysing exactly what happened in that 51-hour hackathon and also uh, what's next for the students, for the other entries, and also for the hackathon as a concept and Sports Pro Live as well. Let's join one of the integral elements to all of this, and it was Paul Guest, who is the Commercial Director at Sports Pro, who joins us uh, now. Paul, a very good morning. Great to see you. This is sort of, it's a big moment, this, for, for everyone involved, because this is the, you know, the prize. This was the opportunity, that the carrot that was dangled in front of everyone. And I think it's worth, you know, at the beginning now, just to sort of get the, the why of the hackathon from you. Hi, Adam. And uh, yeah, good, good to be back on the transformation stage. And I, and I would thoroughly agree with you. I, I don't think uh, when I was their age, I was, would have been quite as calm and collected backstage as, as we've seen them. Uh, I think the, the, the why comes down to probably four different components. We spent a lot of time over the past 12 months, 18 months, speaking directly to educational institutions, speaking directly to lecturers or sports business courses, to students, and then to the industry about their relationship with, with academic institutions, universities, colleges, and that side of things. And there were a few things that, that were highlighted. One of those was students are not getting access to leaders in the industry. They're not able to have that direct conversation. Often it's, it's very content-based uh, that, that they're having to kind of, I guess, inhale that sort of intel from the industry. The second thing is the students don't get the opportunity to share their voice. You know, so much of the industry is built around what does Gen Z think and how many panels have you hosted and I've hosted where it's talking about what does Gen Z want? Nobody's asking them directly. It's, or it's a survey that they're doing. So, so that was a big part of it. And then the, the final aspect was the echo chamber with which sustainability can often exist within sports. There are some fantastic things happening in sustainability and often it's maybe not getting the breakthrough into that broader um, avenue within the industry. You know, it's often looked at, okay, we're gonna start considering sustainability, you know, how much is it gonna cost us? They don't look at it as a revenue stream. They don't look at it as either the social or ecological core of what we have to implement into the industry. So you combine all of these things and you know, being able to put together the hackathon addressed so much of, of this. So uh, that, that's an attempt, I guess, at a concise version of, of the why as, as why you put this together. I certainly got it, Paul. You did the job perfectly. Um, let's deal with, you know, we've done, dealt with the why, Let's deal with the, the, you know, the precise challenge that was set. So 
we kept it quite intentionally broad and in part because of those things that I just I, I just referred to we didn't want to be too prescriptive we didn't want to frame things and say okay you need to provide a solution for this thing because you know who are we to to kind of dictate and uh, make sure you know that a lot of the sports industry can often be treated as well this is the way we do things because that's the way we've always done things so the task that we set them was broad and it was can you provide a solution product service or entire business model in the space of 52 hours that addresses the triple bottom line in sport and and the, some of the things that, that the students as you will see from from the winning team were, were fantastic well paul Without further ado, I think we should get on with it and see this uh, this winning entry. Paul, thanks very much um, for now. Uh, let's welcome the winning team from Sheffield Hallam University. Um, it is it is a big it's a big team, so we will see that the the three three of the the uh, the team first of all, uh, Luke Williams, Holly Roberts, and Katie Preston, and it's their opportunity now to present their winning entry winning entry so good luck guys take it away and many congratulations thanks adam thank you adam polly and katie happy yeah yep. perfect hello and thank you so much for joining us my name is luke and we are here to talk about space joining me for this presentation are polly and katie and for the q a you'll be introduced to the rest of our team dom lauren nat and harrison we are students from sheffield hallam university studying sport business management at both undergraduate and postgraduate level. Focusing on the triple bottom line framework, people, planet, profit. The problem we're wanting to solve is providing easy access to safe spaces for physical activity and sport. The sports facilities industry is estimated to be worth £1.9 billion in the UK, but this is a decline of 17% per year on average since 2016. Those with easy access to sports facilities are 1.2 times more likely to participate in physical activity than those without. Researchers have found that some communities have been compromised in exchange for the pursuit of financial stability. Nationally, the most inactive local authorities have, on average, a third fewer facilities than the least inactive areas. Additionally, unused facilities are also a major problem. Over 70% of facilities in Scotland claim that they had unused spaces available for sport. And 51% of respondents to our survey said that knowing what spaces were available was one of the most significant barriers to participating in sports and physical activity. So, what's our solution? Space. Sports part in for all, creating equal opportunities. Our vision is to contribute to a more active world where sport and activity spaces are sustainable and made accessible for all. Our mission is to provide a sharing economy platform for local sport and activity spaces that are safe, sustainable and accessible, enabling greater participation in sports across many diverse communities. The values we identify with are reliability. We provide a platform that you can put your faith into. Shared passion. We create safe spaces for participation. Trust, we build trust between us, the participants and the spaces. Efficiency, we'd help streamline operations. And positivity, we bring an uplifting and positive experience for all. Space is an app that helps promote and utilize spaces to their maximum potential, all in one platform. And when we say spaces, we don't just mean purpose-built sports facilities, but also school playgrounds, fields, parks and community halls. Each space would have their own profile. It's a one stop shop for the organisation of sports and activities across many diverse communities with a focus on those yet to be reached. You search for availability and inquire about booking that space directly with the venue. Once your booking is complete, you can enjoy your session. To build trust in the platform, you're then able to provide a star rating and review the space to help future users. Your rating would be based on features such as accessibility, cleanliness and safety, ensuring a commitment to diversity, inclusion and equality. We have identified nine sustainable development goals that we believe our app can address, ensuring economic growth across the industry whilst guaranteeing social and environmental stability, sustainability. By providing easy access to spaces, we promote good health and well-being, encouraging sport participation across communities. 
We'd reduce inequalities by creating a platform that is accessible and affordable for all. And we'd ensure the protection and sustainable use of land for the benefit of local communities. We put together a survey and found that the top three reasons adults don't participate were lack of free time, lack of sporting bodies, and lack of knowledge about available spaces. Space would create a community that helps tackle all three. We spoke to sporting organisations wanting space, and they told us they need one centralised booking system to improve efficiency and ease of access when booking spaces. For those with the space, we spoke to community groups, schools and sports clubs, and they told us they needed help streamlining their operations and maximising their revenue. We looked at potential competitors in the UK and compared them across service fee and consumer targets. They're shown on this graph and the bigger the competitors dot, the more facilities they have access to. We'd be interested, once established, in partnering with the local city councils due to their wide reach and access to spaces. This would enable local authorities to stream streamline their operations, create a more efficient service and generate more income. We also looked at current international solutions and found that many similar apps and websites in both the UK and abroad focused only on a single sport or the facilities were solely government owned. As a result of this research, we positioned ourselves as a user friendly premium product that is accessible for both individuals and organisations. Why hasn't this been done before? Well, the narrative for sport and physical activity is shifting and we're moving to support it. An online marketplace platform is not a new idea as we have already identified, but what makes us different is that we are addressing the shift in narrative for sport. For example, over the last 12 years, the focus on sport and physical activity in England has been on working towards an active nation and creating those sporting habits for life. But now, led by the new Sport England strategy uniting the movement, the emphasis is moving towards equality, diversity and inclusion. It's time to tackle the inequalities we've long seen in sport and physical activity. We have to provide opportunities for people and communities that have traditionally been left behind. Our concept works in a similar way to the likes of Airbnb by providing a sharing economy platform, but for safe spaces to participate in sport and physical activity. In terms of the specifics of our business plan, we would look at targeting both B2B and B2C with a focus across four key consumer markets, the active, the inactive, families and organisations. Some of our strong USPs that give us a competitive advantage include focusing on space, not just facilities, by utilising community places such as school halls and fields, internet cafes or any other space fit for physical activity. One platform for all, making booking easily accessible, affordable and accommodating, and also giving not only mainstream sports, but also minority sports and e-sports a louder voice for development. We've outlined a timeline to give you an idea of our plan moving forward over the next five years. Currently, we're at the team and product development stage, and in the next one to two years, we we'll focus on the minority sports level. Beyond that, as we grow within the industry, we diversify to include majority sports, local council spaces, and eventually entering foreign markets. We put together a business cash flow, and our first year projections can be seen here. Our initial figures for year one are based on setting up in one city before expanding nationwide and beyond. Following an initial investment to help with startup costs, we would look to break even after a year once we hit around 25,000 transactions. This is based on us securing 120 venues with each getting an average of four bookings per week. To grow revenue, we take a percentage of commission on each transaction based on the organisation, as well as through advertising, government funding pots and partnerships. In year two, we'll be looking to double the amount of bookings as we begin to expand into different cities. And by year four, we hope to have at least 3,000 different spaces listed nationwide. So what's in it for the organisations and local authorities using the service? Well, we can help them generate money. Following a £10 sign up fee to use the platform, those hiring out their space for an average of £10 a session, four times a week, would earn over £1,800 in a year. If they were to hire out their space for a £50 a session, four times a week, 
they would be earning over £9,300 per year. Of course, some sessions may be charged at a much higher rate and hired out more frequently. So revenue generated for organisations could be even higher. Here's a quick glimpse through the look and feel of the app. We wanted to ensure that the design remained clean so that the customer journey would be as smooth and straightforward as possible. Also allowing you to filter by different options rather than just by the sport, such as the type of venue, location and star rating. So that is the end of our presentation. We are grateful to have the platform to speak in front of you today and excited for what the future may hold with this concept. We'd be really open to speaking with anyone who may be interested. Please contact us regarding any feedback on our concept or the presentation. And we've set up an email, which you can see on the screen now, or each of our LinkedIn profiles are currently at the top of the chat. So scroll up. Thank you so much for listening. We hope you enjoyed hearing about our idea, but the most important thing we want you to remember is to get active and get your space. Print, digital, events, podcasts, sports pro. Luke, Polly, Katie, absolutely fantastic. You nailed it, well delivered. Um, the fact that they put that concept together in the space of 52 hours is, uh, is fairly unfathomable, actually. Uh, now, I would like to welcome to the stage uh, the rest of the team from Sheffield Hallam. So we have Dominic Mills, uh, Natalie Lim, Harrison Walk, and Lauren Wilson. Welcome to the stage, guys. Uh, we're going to have a little bit of a Q&A now with you and find out, dig, dig in a bit more about how you found the hackathon and, and that side of things. Dominic, first question I've got to ask for yourself is, you had 52 hours to, to come up from with this from scratch. How did you make the initial decision to decide on that concept? Uh, well, thanks, Paul. Uh, it, was, it was a great weekend overall and we all thoroughly enjoyed it. And I think when we first got the task, we were all a bit sort of mesmerized. We had no idea what we were, what we were going to talk about. So we all sat together on our virtually and thought, right, mind map. It's one thing we've been taught from day one is get a mind map down, just start listing ideas. What can we do? And it was actually Luke who came up with the idea in the end, who's, who's working or who works in minority sport um, uh, within snow sport in England. And we started bouncing ideas and started talking about what opportunities are for minority sports and for what well, and it, it also coincided with something that we've been learning a lot about during our master's course which is the fact that the problem that there is in the events world uh, where so many different events are being held and they're becoming bigger bigger and more popular and yet um, they're not sustainable and they're not being held if you look at the legacy in 10, 20 years, they're not actually being used and you see a lot of white elephants, as you call them. But we combined these two and uh, thankfully Luke uh, came up with a, a winning idea. Fantastic, Thank, thanks Tom. And Natalie, I'm going to come to you. Uh, obviously, once you, you'd come up with the concept and, and that you kind of ironed out Luke's initial suggestion, you then had access to some, some of the leading innovators and, and industry mentors. How did you find those sessions and, and how did that kind of then craft the concept that you came out with? Well, thank you for that question. I do believe that having the mentors and all that, it was not only a great networking opportunity, but it was a great way to help us improve our concept and their knowledge and their experience has helped us shape our idea better in terms of they know what is better for the app and what to add and what to improve and what to remove. So with their industrial experience, it has definitely helped us a lot. And I can't say that, um, honestly, without their help, we wouldn't have been able to shape our concept this well and to be able to secure that spot in the competition. And, that's, and I, I know a few of them are tuning in. In fact, I can see them leaving comments on the, on the side of the screen. So they're, <laughs> I know they're, uh, they're, they're pretty fucked up as well by their contribution. Harrison, I want to come to you next. 52 hours to come up with pretty much a top to tail business plan um, and then be able to present it and communicate it effectively. How did you find just the general intense format of the hackathon and, and the time constraints you were under? Um, we, I, I personally found it challenging, but uh, enjoyable. I think as a group, um, with all our different skills, um, combining postgraduate and undergraduate, we all had our separate skills. We all stuck to our strengths. And I think we just worked really well as a team. 
um, we was very supportive of each other and it was fairly stress-free like it was a very enjoyable weekend using our skills to come up with an idea that tackles sustainability and yeah i've thoroughly enjoyed it I'm, I'm seriously impressed you've managed to use the word stress-free um I, I don't think if i was in your position that that would have been uh, how <laughs> how i would have probably classed it and how i would have approached it so but clearly reflected in the fact of the solution that you've come up with um, Lauren, uh, key question. I know we're going to be speaking to uh, some of the lecturers from the Sheffield Hallam department next. What is next for you guys as a team and what are your next steps with space? Bear in mind you have the eyes and ears of the sports industry listening into this. <laughs> the big question. <laughs> we love to hear that. Thank you. Um, well, overall, um, for us, Obviously, coming together and working as a team has been really invaluable. Um, working with these guys has been probably the best experience. I'm really thankful for them all. Uh, we've all come in with different ideas and brought them together, and it's worked to be space. <laughs> um, and we hope that we can continue going with this um, to continue working with space and making it into something real. Um, so we're all just hoping that we can jump on board there and see what the future brings. <laughs> Excellent. I'm, I'm going to do a bit more of a, a, a more blunt sales pitch for you guys. For anybody that is tuning in and has seen this concept and wants to, whether you want to help out in terms of kind of mentorship and helping these guys develop it, you know, if, if we're really going to go blunt and if you, if you see this as a genuinely kind of tangible investment opportunity, either get in touch with us or you can get in touch directly with these guys here. All right. Dominic, Natalie, Harrison, Lauren, thank you so much. Congratulations once again, well done. Fantastic effort by, by all of the team. Um, as, as I said, I, I would not have been in the same position of you being able to deliver it quite as stress-free as, as you have done. So thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Right, up next, uh, Adam is coming back onto the stage to join me and we are gonna be joined by, Adam, if, if you'd like to do the introductions. Yeah, Paul, thank you very much indeed. And well done to the, the presentation team dealing with those uh, grilling questions from Paul as well afterwards. Uh, let's welcome uh, onto the stage uh, the sort of the background to this, that some of the decision makers and some of the creators behind the brains that you've just seen there. The, the head of the judging panel, Simon Chadwick, um, the heads of department, the lecturers from Sheffield Hallam University, Olga Polyakova, and also Mark Taylor join us. Uh, ladies and gents, thanks very much for, for, for being on board for this. Simon, I wanted to, to come to you first, if I can, and just, Quite simply, why Sheffield Hallam? My simple answer was, Adam, because they were better than the other teams. That was the simple answer. But I, I, what, what I particularly liked about Sheffield Hallam, and I know that my fellow judges were in agreement, is there was a, a clarity and simplicity to, uh, to the way in which they explained things. Um, you know, I try to drill into students, and I know many of my colleagues do, is you know, keep, keep it simple, stupid. You know, you've got 30 seconds in the elevator. What are you going to say? Uh, a lot of students can't do that, and it's a skill that many need to develop. But the great thing about Sheffield Hallam, thanks to uh, Olga and Mark, is is that this obviously had been drilled into them, and their presentation came across very well, and their ideas were obviously very clear and very uh, coherent. Yep, the, the the kiss theory, keep it simple, stupid, is is one that I I try and subscribe to as much as possible, having been a broadcaster for quite some time, but I don't always achieve it. And I, I'm almost double the age of everyone that's just been presented. So, so well done to all of them. Um, Olga, if I can come to you, just, just to sort of get your overriding sort of emotion from, from seeing the guys present there, present so well, win this competition. Describe your emotions. Is it, is it pride simply? Um, thanks, Adam. Yeah, um, happy, proud, delighted, uh, overwhelmed with emotions, to be honest. And... I just want to say that I think it's been a truly unique experience for students and not only the winning team, but all the participants, all the students who took part in this hackathon. And I've been leading the MSc Sport Business Management at Sheffield Hallam University for the past five years. And since then, we've always given a lot of emphasis to applied learning, to internationalization and also, and also social capital, capital in action. Um, but while we've always uh, pushed students and also intellectually stimulated them, um, this opportunity, this hackathon, been so uh, by far one of the most exciting moments and external events that our students took part uh, in. So um, 
I mean, while I have this opportunity, I would like to really praise uh, Sports Pro uh, for championing and elevating students' voices and uh, helping them to move into a bigger industry in the sport business afterwards. And I do truly think that um, the values of the triple bottom line uh, very much align with this um, first hackathon that happened um, in terms of providing a space and the context uh, for academia and business to work in more sustainable manner. Mark, I wanted to ask you the you know your your perspective on on all of this. Obviously, you know we're talking about space here, and it's very much you know on the ground on Earth. But this is this is a launch pad, isn't it, for these for these students to showcase their talents and to show the industry what they're what they're capable of. How how do you sort of view this in their sort of their career path almost? <clears throat> So, so uh, do, well, I'd echo everything that Olga's just said as well. And in, in, in building on what, what you say about talents, we, we would uh, take the view that talent is often um, in, in the perspective of opportunity times environment. And they've been given a, an opportunity and an environment to showcase uh, what is naturally their ability to work under pressure, do lots of different things and... Uh, I, I, like, I particularly like some of the questions about uh, grappling with difficult concepts and being mes mesmerised with different ideas and coming up with solutions. So all the, all of the teams are pretty much solution orientated, and and the opportunity for all these guys is um, hopefully they'll they'll be able to engage with industry further and then use this as our platform to move their careers on in in whichever direction they choose to to do so. And as people, you know, watching on Sports Pro Live at the moment, you'll you'll see all the messages coming down the side of your screen and the congratulations. And and as Natalie, one of the students, mentioned, you know, saying thank you to the to the mentors and and to the judges, you know, for helping and and helping to shape the concept. Simon, I wanted to just, I know I know it's been a big focus on Sheffield, but you know there will be others that have entered other universities. Um, just a word about the other. You know, the, the general competition that you saw, how, how high was the standard? One of the things I really want to say, and, and again, I, when, I, when I speak to students, I, I say, if you want, you want to win the league, you've got to play in big games. And, uh, and this was a big game. And, and so I would say to anybody who put themselves forward for this, anybody who stood up in front of, a, of an audience and spoke, um, you know, brilliant, fantastic. This is exactly the kind of things that you should thing that you should be doing. You've got to build your CV. You've got to build your experience. You've you've got to you know, you've got to test your knowledge and your your competences in these big games. So for for all of those competitors, uh, uh, two or three weeks ago, well done, really well done. Just as a quick aside, also well done to Mr. Paul Guest and the Sports Pro team because. I think for, for for people like Olga, Mark, and, and me, we we very often um, you know we, we don't have the opportunity to let our students loose on the world. You know, it's 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 almost as though it's a it's an incubation unit, and then hopefully when we let people go free, um, you know, they can make a valuable contribution to the world. But you know, that's very much a gamble. In this particular case, in in, in the case of the competition. You know, this was frontline stuff. This was mentors and people working in the industry and other academics judging judging their work. And so you know, I think it was a fantastic opportunity that Paul and the team created. But across those uh, um, across those other teams, um, it was incredible because there was obviously a, a a real passion and enthusiasm for what people were doing and, and in terms of the future of our industry it was really heartening but i, I ultimately sheffield hallam you know they, they're kind of they think they're so cool now because they won but it was but it was close it was close you know there were some other people out there who really wanted to kick your asses sheffield hallam and, and they were so close um but ultimately as i said you know sheffield hallam uh, keep it simple stupid but equally, I think it was an idea that worked. We we, we envisaged, the, the, the judges envisaged it would work. But as I say, it was very, very close. And what I would do for anybody who's here today, whether you are working at a university or you're a student, you've got sons, daughters in education, encourage them next year. You know, we want more more entrants and, and stronger entrants and, and a more diverse number of, uh, of entrants. But uh, yeah, it was a really cool competition to be involved in. And it was a really 
special thing for me, having worked in in university education for nearly the last thirty years in sport. It was like a, it was almost like a culmination or a, or a pinnacle for me. Well, that's great to hear. Look, Simon. Um, Olga, Mark, thank you very much for your time. Congratulations in particular to, to Olga and Mark and Simon. Thanks very much for leading the judges. Paul, I just wanted to come to you, if I may, to, to sort of wrap up. And it sort of kicks on from what Simon was saying there. You know, what is next? Two-part question, I suppose, you know, for, for Sheffield and the other entries and then for, for future hackathons from Sports Pro. Wrap it up if you can. I'll, I'll do my best to, to keep it concise. Uh, not quite the wordsmith that Simon is. Specifically for Sheffield Hall and the other teams that have, have entered, again, a big priority for this was to provide them with a, a platform to share their voice and to share their insights. So our editorial team are going to be doing features on not just uh, the winning team with, with Sheffield Hall, but the, the, the top three, you know, quite in depth and showcasing their solutions. And then myself and somebody I'd like to make a, a special mention to, which is uh, Vita Maloney Burke, who was an architect of much of the hackathon, who is a, a, a relatively recent graduate. And, you know, as, as we said, is, has got a, an eye and a, a pulse on Gen Z and, and kind of that younger side of the millennials aspect. So Vita and myself will be showcasing uh, every single one of the concepts that was presented to the judges uh, across our editorial channels and our social channels to, to share their ideas with the sports industry. Now, more broadly, what we're aiming towards next year, we, we have been a bit overwhelmed, to be honest, in terms of their positive response. It wasn't what we quite as much as what we we're expecting. We already have teams from um, Australia, New Zealand, South Korea, Canada. Um, we, we had teams from Turkey who are already uh, registering for next year. So in terms of the breadth of the teams that are going to be entering next year. Um, I'm incredibly thankful as well to, to, to Simon and the rest of the judges and the mentors who have given us quite specific and tangible feedback about what worked, maybe what didn't, how we can improve. And we're going to be wrapping that up. But the, the hackathon of next year, what we have in the plans uh, will be uh, on a, a much broader scale. I think that's probably as, about as much as I'm able to share uh, at the moment. Well, it's very exciting. And Paul, well done for, for all in your involvement in this and, and getting it going. Uh, really appreciate your time. And well done to, to everyone um, who took part in the, the hackathon. Many congratulations, of course, to, to Sheffield Hallam. Um, but everyone that entered and everyone that took part, whether a mentor or a judge, and you know, just echoing what, what Paul said there, if you are interested in taking part in in future hackathons um there is a, a hackathon tab an area on sportsprolive.com uh, or if you do want to contact sheffield hallam of course all those details are there at the side of your screen if you're interested in space it needn't be the final frontier today it could be the, the future uh, for you and your business help us spread the word about the sports pro podcast Subscribe, like and share our content on social. Join the conversation on Twitter with the hashtag SportsProPod. And if you're enjoying our work, why not leave us a rating and a nice review on your podcast platform of choice. And if you want to get in touch, you can send us an email, podcast at sportspromedia.com. The Sports Pro Podcast, we're listening to. Okay, that will do it for this edition of the Sports Pro Podcast. Thank you very much to the students from Sheffield Hallam University. For your space idea we will watch with interest to see how that develops over the next couple of years thanks as well to the athletics adam leventhal and our own paul guest for leading us through that session thank you to matt campelli thanks owen and to hattie park thank you very much for having me thank you for coming on thanks to all of you for listening we'll be back with you again very soon bye bye The Sports Pro Podcast is published by Sports Pro Media. The producer is Ed Dixon.